Even men at the top of their game find themselves wanting more from life, whether it's more meaning, unshakable confidence, a bigger impact, more money, deeper love, a hotter sex life, or a powerful legacy. Find out how good your life can be on this episode of Man Alive. Also, as I've supported men in their love and work lives for 15 years now, many men have asked me for the right words to say to be more attractive, desirable, and more of a leader. And I found it's not so simple as giving scripts or lines because at the root of a connected and affectionate relationship and being more effective and inspiring at work is your ability to influence others. But most often influence is not gained or lost with words. It's from what I call the invisible factors. So I created a quick guide for you called three ways men lose influence at work and with women. So you can understand how these invisible factors work and what has women and colleagues both more inspired to say yes. I think you're also going to be surprised to find out the moment when your influence actually begins. So grab the guide for free at shanajamescoaching.com slash three ways. That's shanajamescoaching.com slash the number three and the word ways, W-A-Y-S. Or you can text ALIVE to 44144. That's the word ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144. I hope you enjoy the guide and this episode. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Man Alive. I am excited to be here today with Lucas Mack. Lucas, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I'm honored. Yeah, uh, I'm honored to have you here. And we're going to talk about a really important topic, you know, which is healing from past abuse or healing from past trauma. And I'll do your official bio in a moment, but you know, you've had a, a, an intense life and a hard life. And the way I see you and know you is that you've turned out to be a stellar human being. And so, you know, I really want to dive into what does it take to heal and how is it that someone can go through a really um, challenging time, especially in young life, but later life too, and then come out on the other side and be inspired to serve and support people as opposed to you know, saying, fuck it, because you easily could have said that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I did say it at one time, and I you did, did, you know, I did go through, <clears throat> when, you know, I s- survived a suicide attempt when I was 20 years old. Wow, yeah. Um, and my life after that suicide attempt was really two worlds. It was world prior to being 20 years old and living with the abuse and the the confusion and the fear and then after surviving that attempt never wanting to look back because it was so painful and then trying to just run as feral on forward oh and i ran so hard almost and to the point where i collapsed i went to the hospital in an ambulance wow uh, went in my body shut down i went in anaphylactic shock wow. um and this was when my second child was just five weeks old and oh. my wife was terrified and i just was trying to outrun the pain mm-hmm. to the point where i finally got to a place where i couldn't outrun it any wow. longer wow so yeah yeah. All right. Well, let me give your, um, you know, your official bio so people know who you are and then we can get more into, right, what happened in those moments and how you actually came through that. Sounds great. So, all right. Lucas works with people who are looking for healing, forgiveness, rest, balance, purpose, and peace in their lives by reconnecting them to an understanding of the true definition of love and the power it brings by giving them personal empowerment, a clear vision, purposeful direction, and an ability to also give back. So growing up in an abusive home where fear and confusion ruled his life, he's been able to break the cycle and find true healing. And he's learned that love gives truth permission to come forth, resulting in personal freedom, and that the reason we aren't free is because we don't know what true love is. So Lucas leads people to experience change in themselves in order for them to impact the world through spiritual reconnection, personal healing, and legacy building. That's right. Amazing. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to hearing too a little bit more about what true love is, but let's go back to that moment, right? You described a moment where you're trying to outrun your pain. You're trying to outrun you know, everything that's happened to you in the past that has shaped in large part who you are 
yeah. in that moment. And so you end up in a, in a, an ambulance with anaphylactic shock and your body shutting down, right? Yeah. Help us see more what's happening. So I was working, um, I started a, a business. So my wife and I were in TV and we're TV reporters. And then I came back to the station in Seattle and I had this idea to start a business. And then I put like manic, yeah, I was almost manic to a degree of how much I worked and just my identity became wrapped in the success and the failures. Mm -hmm. And then that was a roller coaster yeah. because I really had no, I had no self-worth. All mm. my self-worth was on what I could do to get approval, uh -huh. which never came. Yeah. And if it came, it was only in a way that made, you know, my father look good. So it was never for me. It was, I always knew it, it was yeah. never, it was just, it was a never ending hamster wheel. I could not yeah. outrun. So painful. And um, so I was working all the time, put a lot of stress on our marriage, and then we had kids, and that that was a whole. That doesn't new, put any more stress on. <laughs> yeah, that made things so much easier. Yeah. Um, but I I became um, home was never a safe place, but I never really was able to put words to that. So even yeah. being home in a an environment that was safe with a wife that loved me and children, uh, that loved me, I still carried the sense of. Homes Danger. not safe. Home yeah. where, is where I'm judged. And, you know, we've talked, you know, off this podcast of when the spouse attacks and then, well, what do you do? It just makes you shut down more. more. And I became really a shell where everyone outside saw me shiny, looked right. good, the family, the kids, very successful entrepreneur, been on mm. TV, been a reporter. But inside, I was, was dying. dying inside. I was physically dying and yeah. I was, I was shutting down and it got to the place where I was drinking all the time. Mm -hmm. I was struggling with pornography. I was struggling. I was just anything that could soothe the mm -hmm. pain, anything that could just make me feel better. Yeah. And my wife and I, she's, she's incredible. She is so incredible. And she, she didn't know how to help me. I really, in trying to outrun the pain, projected a sense of I'm perfect. Like, what do you mean help me? Look at all the things I'm doing. I'm, I'm taking care of this family. I'm providing, you know, like it just yes. became defensive mechanisms. And when I was 34 years old, mm -hmm. I started having flashbacks of the abuse first person. And I remember when I was talking to my wife and even friends grow like friends after 20 years old, I had asked yeah. them because I was aware of my thoughts. I always had third person thoughts uh -huh. of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I would say, and I'd ask people, do you have first person memories or third person memories of your childhood? And people mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I never think about it. I'm like, man, I can, I like one time I got beat with a bullwhip and oh. I could see myself being beat. I know exactly where I am. Uh -huh. I, like I would disassociate. You're outside of yourself outside watching. Of body, watching. Yes. And all of a sudden this one day in May, uh, a few years ago, um, I started, it was like star Wars where they go into hyperdrive and I started, I was back you were in, there. I was <laughs> there. I was there. And it made me I don't want I could cry right now actually. It was, yeah. it, was uh, it was it was real. Yeah. It was a real it was a real thing and um I I'm just so appreciating you right now for being so honest and vulnerable and oh, I thanks. know this is what you've come to right that this is yeah. part of the feeling power but I'm still yeah, it thanks. takes a lot of courage. Thanks. And it does. Um What do you do? You know, I got to this place where I went to a therapist that week. That was a Sunday night. By Thursday, I'm into a therapist. I I had a stigma against therapists, <laughs> like well, therapy, like that's all weakness. I was just it, everything was prior to that moment. Tough it out, grind it out. Yeah, you know, just like literally Ugh. zero room for softness. Yeah, and um and deep down, I'm soft. I've always been soft. Like right, I'm I can sure see I was it in your eyes, little boy. <laughs> you know, like I, mm -hmm. but that, that, that was not allowed. And, um, yeah. so all of a sudden I'm in these flashbacks and I thought I was losing my mind and 
it was a really traumatic week. It was a really confusing week yeah. too of how am I aware of, I, I'm, I mean, it, I could remember the bed being like bent over and my face is in the bed. Like mm-hmm. it was really bizarre. Yeah. And so I went into therapy and I was dealing with um, that. And I remember the therapist talking to me and, and just asking me questions and, and I would tell him and he was like, well, a healthy parent would do this. Mm -hmm. And it was as if he inserted a rod into my brain. Like I had never even, a healthy way of being was never even, my brain didn't even go to that realm. Like I wouldn't have even known like that existed. And I was, and this is how, and it was affecting my parenting and my own marriage. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm like, yeah, that is a health, like that's, that's incredible. I want to be, I want that. I want to be like that. And, Uh, and so I was in therapy for two years mm -hmm. every week, sometimes twice a week. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, right. Good for you. Cause there's no shame in that. I mean, there's no shame. Sometimes what we need, we have physical coaches, we have, you know, personal trainers, we have life coaches, we have, but where's the emotional and the, the, the mental trainers yeah. there's no stigma in in therapy no um and so i was in this journey but what i couldn't solve in therapy and i uh, had a lot of healing and it was mm-hmm. beautiful mm-hmm. and it was beautiful that it was a male therapist where i have not ever felt safe around men yeah, yeah. and um which it was just, it was just beautiful how it aligned yeah Yet I would still struggle with suicidal thoughts and I would call it getting snipered where, I mean, it got to the place where I was in therapy so for so long that I was aware of these things, but I couldn't, nothing, I couldn't fix the like, uh-huh. you couldn't turn it off or make it stop or yeah, mm-hmm. like something's broken inside of me. Um, and that is where I want to get out of my body and I'm yes. really good at getting out of my mind. Like right. I'm, been you, that's what you needed mind. to survive yeah. when you yeah. were under. And so that I call it getting snipered where something would work would not go well, or I would feel inadequate or whatever would trigger. Yeah. And I would, it would just go into the self beat up that I am, I'm not intelligent. I'm broken. I'm mm-hmm. something I, and I cause people pain. And so mm-hmm. I need to get out of me and my buddy who really I credit to saving my life. He was a 10 year Navy SEAL, a medically retired SEAL. And uh, he called me one night at a night. This is, um, so I was having these flashbacks and two years later he calls me and he said, he's crying. This is the toughest man. This is a guy that led the largest Mm. special forces mission in the United States history. Wow. is like, he looks like, a panther. He's six four. He looks like GI Joe. He yeah. is just—he's the real deal. And he called me crying and soft. Yeah. And I had never heard him. I'm like, what the? And I was in the depth. My wife was out of town. Um, I was with the kids, and I'm laying on the couch, fighting the urge to get out of me. Yeah. And he calls me, and he tells me about this emotional intelligence training program that he went to. And he thought of me and I didn't Mm -hmm. talk to him in a while because I was embarrassed. I didn't talk. One of the things being in pain, I think a lot of you don't talk, you don't want it's weakness or it's right in the, in the culture you've been, I've got to do this on my own and I can't show this to anyone else. Exactly. And that also to back up a little bit is also what led me to feeling like I was broken because I had read after I was 20 I'd read the Bible seven times cover to cover in 14 years. I had read every spiritual text that I had, I had come through. I would have been the most ardent Buddhist monk had, I mean, I needed, I I needed what is true and what, what is real and what, and um, yet I found myself, you know, 14 years later, my buddy calling me and saying, Hey, you know, you should go to this emotional intelligence training. Wow. I just love that conversation between the two of you where 
he's vulnerable with you and you're clearly vulnerable. You've been vulnerable with him and that like, yeah. Oh, thank God for that. Thank truly, truly. Yeah. Thank God for that. And the other thing is I have never talked to someone so long on the phone in my life. Not, not my wife or we're dating, never a girlfriend. We talked for two and a half hours on the phone yeah. and crying and processing. And, um, so I went to this training and not, and, Truly, not everyone has to go to a training, but what I learned, and not even really what they taught, it was just what I experienced. It was the very first time I was ever around people, people I didn't know, strangers, Mm -hmm. that showed me unconditional love. Mm. I could have said anything and they would have been, I mean, the therapist was was close to that, but yeah. Not, not fully. I felt like, you know, they're taking notes and like, you know, they're right. still, they're still like a human to human. To it. Yes. Yeah. It's still like therapist patient or whatever they call yeah. it. Client. Um, but this was the first time where I felt safe enough to, to go there. And part of the, the theme is the only way out is through. Yes. So you cannot outrun. They're talking about you cannot outrun. And I'm like, you here you are like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I've been trying so hard to outrun so this. So hard. Yes. So I thought if I was more articulate, if I knew more, if I read right. more, if I knew the Bible, if I prayed more, I, would, I fasted from 20 to 25 years old every Monday, 24 hours straight. Every you fasted. Monday fasted. Wow. I prayed. I'd pray for two hours a day. I'd go out into fields. I'd pr- I mean, I was trying to like fix wow. something. Which is, I just want, you know, to say for the listener, right? It's like, right, you can try all of these things to be better and better and more intelligent and more articulate and more this and more that, right? And that's where it just starts to, the crank gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Yes. Yes. Truly. It's like a noose. And it's just the more you strive for something that you truly want, it's like the noose gets a little tighter and tighter. And I really have a lot of compassion for for men and women, but specifically men who that noose is around their neck tightly right now. Yes. And a, a lot of dads are killing themselves right now. There's the yeah. suicide rates, the highest it's ever been. Astronomical. Being adult, it, you know, veterans, it's yeah. and because we are lacking love. And so, you know, you read my bio is, is, is it was the very first time I experienced true love. Unconditional yeah. Say more about love. that. Like what, so is, is true love unconditional love or what? Always. How There's do you- no such thing as unconditional love. Love is always unconditional. And mm. we have placed l- narrative around this word of love yeah. and bastardized its true meaning where it means nothing more than to say something sick when we mean it's cool mm. or something's cool when we think it's neat or something's neat when we actually like it. Okay, and wait, help me understand that. So you're saying the bastardization of love is Using what? the word in a form, using taking the word and applying it to a different meaning. So Got it. you could say, oh, that's sick. You know, I don't know if you talk like that and I don't right. talk like that, but I hear people say, oh, that's sick. And they mean it's cool. Oh, they mean it's and cool. Even, even saying the word cool mm-hmm. they mean they like it uh-huh. Uh-huh. so we're we're, we're getting like dis- more and more distant correct yes so it's like i love milkshakes i love sunshine i love my wife i love my kids and the greeks tried to solve this conundrum and they i think were the real cause of this confusion because then they said well there's the concept of love yeah. and that is always unconditional. That's always giving. Yes. However, we can't always be unconditional. So how I apply love to my brother as the Eros and, or, you know, agape, Agape, all all those different applications. And I think that's where the breakdown happens is that Mm -hmm. love means in in Hebrew, the word love me is ahava, which means to give. So when does love stop loving right right it love is always loving. love it is. Never stops love is it always get, it always yeah. it is and then always. we humanize it and twist it i mean and exactly. i remember getting divorced and actually after that just being like i am on a quest to understand what actually is love right it mm. took me many years to be able to say to someone in a romantic way i love you or i'm in love with you because i was like i don't actually know what love is anymore i thought i had all these ideas of what love mm. is but what is love actually? And so I, I can yeah. 
relate to this, you know, really trying to deeply understand, okay, what is love? And then what are we doing to it in, in human ways that does kind of bastardize it or kills it? It, kill, it, it really does kill it. And especially from the purest form of love that we should know is from parent to child. Mm. And there you go. There's the answer why we don't know love. Mm. It's because these generational I call it curses, even though that might seem like a biblical narrative, but I pulled that from it. It's we are cursing the next generation, dooming them as to, we're acting, as we're living. And mm-hmm. we are so a child, a innocent being as a puppy or a, a, a kitten or a baby animal. If you saw people treat baby animals like we treat our children, we would go out and hang. I mean, <sighs> you know, we would lynch these people. Mm-hmm. We would we verbally, you know, not truly, but you see what I'm saying? Like we would be, right. there would be such would be an appalled outcry. And we wouldn't let it happen. Oh, and- we would stop it. Yeah. But all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's, it's it becomes children, private like, in someone's becomes, home and we feel like we can't oh, interfere, right? All of those things. And, it's, and truly it is. Because I'm, it's funny, now you just triggered this. I mean, yes, it is private. Homes are private. I'm, I don't know why it just triggered me. Like, yeah, I'm a libertarian. I love like privatization. I love all those things. And yet, mm-hmm. if there's ever duality, then it's all inauthentic. Mm. And it's all a lie. And lies mm. cannot bring freedom. Only truth brings freedom. Yeah. And so love is the only means by which truth will come forth. Mm. If, and I call, I talk to everyone is truth is like a groundhog yeah. and it want it has to breathe. It's a mammal. It needs air. It wants to come get light. But the minute it sniffs, it looks around. And if it sniffs judgment in any form, it will yeah. burrow down even deeper than it was yeah. before to the point where that truth might have died deep down where people don't know the truth. I mean, it's right. I even in themselves, it, right? They like, don't know it in themselves. Yeah. And so t- love, unconditional love allows truth to come forth, mm. resulting in our freedom. And this is my mission in life is to help people understand that judgment only is enslaving. It only enslaves. And I am an abolitionist of the soul. I want people, I don't think this will any more macho men. The macho men days are over. over. They're over. What we need is more courageous liberators of souls. Mm. Men and women willing to stare face, uh, fear and shame and guilt and judgment in the face, in the yeah. eyes and say, no. Yeah. no well, And this is amazing because one of the things I often see working with men is that there's a kind of courage of like, I'm going to go jump off a mountain and hella ski or I'm going to go whitewater kayaking yeah. or I'm going to yeah. you know, climb Mount Everest. And yet the courage to express love yes. or to say, I feel hurt and the vulnerability, like that seems to stop people, you know? Yes. So, yes. so I'm curious for you, how, how do you work with a man in that way to help him actually be able to have the courage in that way? Or how did you find the courage to be vulnerable and to be loving in those moments? The first The first step when I work with men is there's nothing that they can say to tell them. There's literally, there's nothing anyone could say that I will judge them. I've heard it all. Yeah. I've experienced quite a lot. There's what, okay. And how are we going to. And that doesn't make you unlovable. And that doesn't make you bad. And and that doesn't. Exactly. Okay. And how are we moving forward? Mm -hmm. It's like, say it. And here's what I think, one of the things that the talks that I give, every mother drops down the X chromosome. Hmm. Every human actually starts in the feminine. Mm -hmm. Take that macho man. (laughs) (laughs) You actually started as a receiver Uh before the father came 
and by no choice of their own, either gave an X chromosome, which created a female, Mm -hmm. or a Y chromosome, which created a male. Mm -hmm. However, the very basic function of our origin is to receive. Uh. And so I believe men, the job of a male is to be a protector of all humanity Mm. to receive love. Mm. So we need strong men, but strong men with purpose of protecting and being the safest person in a room, not a person that's strong and looked at as a possible threat in a room. Yeah. Well, and interesting, I just love your take on receiving too, because I, I feel very strongly that men need to learn to receive. Most men need to learn to receive a lot more than they're receiving. And in some ways in the culture right now, people are, you know, confused by that statement, like what men are getting things that they, you know, and men are attacking or abusing or all these things. And I think part of that comes from a lack of receiving and a lack of feeling nourished and full. And so then there comes, I'm going to go manipulate or take. So I love that you have your attention on receiving, especially for men. It's so important. And I, I mean, I had a grandfather who, when I was very young, would try to hug him and he would stick his fist in my chest and push me away and wouldn't allow me ever to hug him. And Mm. he would squeeze the fat, the soft of my hand in between my index finger and my thumb and try to hurt me and laugh about it. And even in that really affected (laughs) my view of like, now looking back, that's a broken human. Yeah. That's a, a broken, I mean, a hurt, human wounded human. That, that won't accept a hug, won't receive a hug from a child. From a child, right. And then what happens is when we're hurt, mm-hmm. all we can do is hurt. Yeah. Hurt others. ourselves. Hurt and ourselves and hurt others, right? A, a hurt person cannot heal another. Right. And a healed person cannot hurt another. Mm. So my mission is to see the hurting get healed and the healed go out and heal others. Beautiful. And healing is once I experience healing, I wouldn't trade it for anything mm. in the world. I would not trade it. There's nothing the world mm. can offer me. That's in, more important. Yeah, yeah. In exchange for my healing. I mean, I just love how much hope to me I'm hearing you bring, right? For anyone who's hurting, that there is hope and that you can transform and change and, you know, be loved. And whatever those places that you may feel of shame or embarrassment or there's something wrong with me, right? That that, that can change and that can heal. And, and then it's not true. You know, it's like part of what I hear you saying and what I know in myself is, those voices are not true. Any of the voices in our heads that are saying anything critical about us, they're not real. They're just, you know, a survival mechanism that happened when we were young. Keep us safe. It's, yeah. it's so interesting. The ego is so fascinating because it is trying to keep that child safe. safe. And then we outgrow that first moment of trauma. Yeah. And then if we are still ruled by the ego, Mm -hmm. as opposed to acknowledging the ego. And this is what I learned in the training that I went to was, okay, thank you. I hear you. Uh And I'm choosing. I'm going forth. I am free. I am loved. And and one of the things I have guys do is write down affirmations and say them every single day and put them Mm. right by their bed. So I have five words. Yeah, what are yours? Um, I have two, two sayings that I am a loving, kind, and powerful leader. I'm a mm-hmm. loving, kind, and powerful leader. I'm a loving, kind, and powerful leader. I'm a loving, kind, and powerful leader. And then there are five words by my bed, which are really dealing with my ego and, mm-hmm. and telling the ego, it's okay. And it is, I am safe. Mm-hmm. I am loved. I am free. I am abundant. I am powerful. Those are the mm-hmm. five things that I needed to know. To know and to hear to hear I needed to know now, now as a 37 year old father of three married 13 years, I still need to know I am safe. I am loved. I am free. I'm abundant. I am powerful. And because I used to not trust a soul, that was one of the things that going down to this leadership training, I didn't trust anyone. Right. Well, why would you have when that was your template, right? People were not trustworthy. The people who were supposed to help you grow and care for you and love you were the ones who were hurting you. Right. And then I became 
a really good stone thrower there you know that there, jesus said he was without sin cast the first stone and everyone oh. walks away i became a really good stone thrower because i was hurt yeah so i was hurting other people yeah and i joke around that i became like the movie elf if you've seen elf and they're having that snowball fight and that last mm-hmm. guy's running away in central park and you like drills them from like a mile away or something. It's just totally ridiculous. But I became But you could see and you would just Yeah, because I'm trying to justify this, you know, I'm grinding it out. Why how can you not grind it? Why are you not? Uh Why are you not? But really I'm like, I'm exhausted. I'm I'm thinking I'm gonna have a heart attack. I would sit in my office sweating, just sitting, just sweating like I'm gonna die any second. And and thankfully I didn't and thankfully very grateful. Life. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And again, I just am amazed, right? It's like, not only did you not die, you also are deeply committed to your own healing and others healing and to, you know, truth and love. And it's really inspiring. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I, yeah. I want to see the world. The world that I want to live in is possible. Mm-hmm. It is possible. Mm-hmm. And it's a world where people treat people like people yeah. to treat them as a full functioning human being that treat them in a way that they would want to be treated themselves mm. always. Yeah. And Hillel, the elder, the great rabbi Hillel, the elder said that which you deem hateful unto yourself, do not do unto another. Huh. This is the whole essence of Torah. The rest huh. is commentary. Now go mm. and look. like, this mm. is the whole essence of it. That which you deem hateful, don't do unto don't another person. Don't do that to others. And then Jesus came and said, "Love, you know, do unto others." Like the opposite is, don't become an isolationist. Yeah. Also, go out into the world and love people, but do unto them as you would want them to do unto you. And I think finding that balance. Yeah. I had a rabbi. My one of my friends uh, is a rabbi, and he asked me one time. He said, "Have you ever seen a bird fly with one wing?" Hmm. I'm like, "No, I haven't." Does it? No, interesting question. Really yeah, interesting. You know, I, okay, game on. I like this. And uh, I said, no, he said, exactly. He said, it takes both wings to create tension. And in huh. that tension creates the lift. Mm. So we need the not doing and the doing. We need the, we need the femininity and the masculinity. We need yeah. the vulnerability and the, the hero side of ourselves. We need both in balance. Mm. So that we can rise and lift together. Is mm, I love that. I love that. What would you say to men who, um, I don't well, I don't know. I, I just started thinking about how the, there's, there's two sides of this. Like a man who's going through something like you, who feels like he's dying inside. And, um, and in a way, it's coming from the internal, right? Like from your past experience. And so, and then there are men who, and maybe this is the same man, you can tell me, who get stuck in dynamics that are coming from the outside where their boss is treating them a certain way or their partner's treating them a certain way or their kids are treating them a certain way. And so it's showing up in the moment and he's like, you know, feeling fucked for lack of a better word right yeah, like yeah. i can't get out of this and this, it's everywhere or it's in these big dynamics and how do you work with men who are experiencing some of those things in the moment in the now both sides those that i truly understand the the internal struggle and the internal death and then the external circumstance that just seems to beat someone down and paralyze them yeah both all of us, it all is an internal, it all starts from within. Mm. If, if we yeah. are leading ourselves, yep. we can lead others no matter what circumstance. Yep. And so we have to go back to the place of when was the first time that this way of being that we are exhibiting to the world, uh-huh. when did this first start? Who uh-huh. told you to be quiet when you had something to say. Right. Who, Who told you, you to be quiet when someone else was yelling at you or shaming you or exactly. not standing exactly. up for you? Who, who intimidated you like sit, sit down and like you sat down and then and that stayed with you because if you got up, 
worst things would happen. Yes. Well, whenever that happened at whatever age, and it doesn't have to be that guys are all in abusive homes. It could be they wanted to be loved and there was just a void of love. So then they don't know how to, you know, it can be both sides, but wherever someone is, it, it starts from the inside. Mm-hmm. It starts internally. So yes. why is your boss, why does your boss, now there are t- terrible people in the world. I'm not denying that, but why does your boss, like what's the way of being that you're creating that allows your boss to think that he can talk to you, talk that to you like that? Yeah. Because I knew I attracted abusive men in my life. You did. I was just attracting them like a magnet. It was like, uh-huh. because that was my way of being like, I'm not worthy. I need help. Like I'm just this like nothing powerless. And right. these guys that love that power were just coming in and my business. And they don't even necessarily know it. It's not conscious. They're just. Totally. It's just. We're just. My position. Drawn to each other. Like, yeah, exactly. And it was when I shifted, it was like, Wow. That I am a loving, kind, and powerful leader. I mean, these are the affirmations that I, yes. and everything has changed. And I will say this, I, I, I don't like proverbial sayings. I don't like the surfacey, like pat on the back, like bumper um, sticker slogans. Yeah. So I'm qualifying what I'm about to say because it's not that. Okay. But it could be interpreted to some if they don't really understand where I'm coming from is, the life that you really want, mm-hmm. the dream that intrinsically was given to you as a gift from yeah. your very inception is possible on the other side of fear, mm. is possible on the other side of your healing. Mm. And let me say from example, not to say, oh, look at me, but I can't no, tell no, you from I, that you actually did no, this. My, yeah. my, my marriage radically changed my children, my home, life, finances, like every everything changed. changed. And I wrote the other day, if you strive for love, love will always flee. If you strive for peace, peace will always flee. Uh-huh. If you strive for joy, joy will always flee. They wait for you to, to stop just finally really surrender. Yeah. And okay, and so you brought up fear. Mm. So let's just go into that a little bit too. You said, you know, it's on the other side of fear or when you face your fear, yes. that's when, what happens? What happened for you? Well, I had to go back as a 36-year-old man. I had to go back as a four-year-old in that moment. And I had to speak to the abuser yeah. as myself now, but giving right. voice to that child. To that child, right? And, and face the fear the that you car. never. I remember turning. I physically like turned and looked and said, you know, <laughs> in ways that are not necessarily appropriate for this podcast, but yeah. do not touch me. Yes. Do not touch me. Yeah. Do not touch me. And I was screaming it as like, don't lay up. I mean, finger, finger. Don't yeah. come near me. Yes. Yes. And that was the very first, like this massive volcanic shift inside me where I was no longer afraid to go to the most painful place. And once right. I was at the most painful place, then it was just degrees of healing along the way. It wasn't right. going less, you know, a little more painful, a little more painful. Let's, you know, cause that's a progression that we may never get to, yeah. but the jump to the most painful, the part. most painful parts. Right. And in that, and I've walked people through a process like that too, right. Where then in that you actually find your voice and yes. your strength and your courage and all oh. the parts of you that, you know, we're kind of sitting down and taking it quietly Yes, are then back online. I mean, my, before that, um, before going through that emotional intelligence program, I had written a, a published book of written, but it didn't do that well. And, but my Instagram was private. My, I was just on lockdown. Like yeah. didn't. And then I found, like you said, I found my voice and all of a sudden, Oh, this is who I'm actually supposed to be. This is what I've always yes. known. Like I am, I do love people. And, mm. and on my website, I talk about spiritual connection. Mm-hmm. And I joke around with people because you never hear the person that says, 
oh, I'm not spiritual, I'm religious. <laughs> and that always <laughs> makes me laugh. I, <laughs> I'm not spiritual, I'm religious. Right. And people are always saying, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. And both are, you know, religion's a modality, it's a methodology to know the a realm outside of one's physical existence as mm-hmm. philosophy is a m- methodology to understand the physical existence and mm-hmm. and that which is so there's just different methodologies but the spiritual side of us i think is incredibly important i asked men when was the first time men and women but i work with men when was the first time you stopped believing in an all-knowing being mm-hmm. if you're if you raised in a home that had Santa Claus, the very first time you were told an all-knowing being who loved you, Hmm. who gave you good things, was a lie. What did that, do you think that just didn't affect you? Like, oh, Oh, okay. Um, What other all-knowing beings are good out there? And and so this is also a great, um, I believe we all, are made to receive spiritually like the good that is, mm. you know, whether call it universe, source, but all that is, is good. Yeah. The garden life, I heard this old rabbi speak, actually the founder of Chabad said, life is still a garden. Huh. It's our job just to dig it out and bring out the good. It's still good. Uh, even the when it's messy or good. even when, even when it's dying, messy, right? It's like, pain. it's still good. Huh. And how would we not know good unless we first knew that which was bad? How would I know healing if I didn't know pain? How would I know love if I first didn't know the depths of fear? Uh, and, yeah. oh, sorry. I love, I love, right, the contrast and the paradox that, you know, more, the older I get, the more I'm seeing it. I think you saw it from a very young age and, mm. you know, many people do have that trauma and abuse at such a young age and, and it's hard to digest the fact that, right, we have to sometimes experience the darkness in order to know the light and have yes. to experience the being trapped in order to know the freedom. But I just feel how much hope that also gives of like, all right, if I'm feeling that darkness right now, you know, it's because I'm recognizing the absence of light or the absence of. Yes, it's an absence of exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Because we've never opened a closet door and brace for darkness to spill out. No. Huh. We know the laws of the universe, wherever there's light, darkness goes away. Yeah. And wherever there's darkness, there's an absence of light. Yeah. And it's the same with fear. Wherever there's fear, there's an absence of love. Mm. But wherever love goes, fear goes away. Fear goes away. Oh, it is, beautiful. they cannot coexist together. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. No, thank you for this. And thank you for just the courageous journey you've been on your whole life and for being willing to face those deepest darkest fears and come to the surface with the gold of wow I can love people you know I can make space for whatever anybody brings to me and I feel you know really really grateful that you're out here as a as a lover and what did you call it a, um we need Soulful uh, liberators, courageous, courageous liberators, liberators of, the of the soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me on. I'm I'm honored. Yeah, no, I feel honored to have you. Any any last thing? What what do you want to leave men with? Solomon wrote, "Hope deferred makes the heart sick." The sickness and the depression, the angst, the noose that you feel around your neck is a a lack of knowing there is hope. And I want everyone to know that there is hope and it, it, it can be okay when we choose for it to be okay. Mm. Thank you. And thank you for being a living example of that. Right. I know you're just, you're not talking about this theoretically you've lived it. So that hope feels even more palpable because of that. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I'm so glad you joined us for today's episode of Man Alive. I hope it gives you a sense of what's possible and how good your life can be. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful for you to subscribe to Man Alive and write a quick review that helps men like you find us. And again, head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash manalive to get outtakes, videos, and raw footage I only share there. These are some of the most interesting parts of these expert conversations.
You can also grab your copy of The Unknown Power to accelerate your career and solidify your confidence with women because the two are related and I know you don't have to settle for one or the other. Join us each week for a new episode of Man Alive.